Refrigerants are chemicals that make a refrigerator or air conditioner work. They're wonderful. They keep food fresh and people cool. Except they're one of the most potent greenhouse gases in the world. Unfortunately, in many developing countries, refrigerants are frequently released into the atmosphere because it's the easiest way to get rid of them. This practice contributes to the amount of greenhouse gas floating around in the atmosphere, thereby affecting the climate. Louis Potox saw this issue and decided to launch Recool It, a company that destroys refrigerants before they enter the atmosphere and sells the carbon credits to fund the work. Check out this episode to listen to a sustainability champion making big strides to reduce climate change. Hey, Lewis, thanks so much for joining the Sustainability Champions podcast. Great to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, likewise. Um, the, the way I like to start these conversations is kind of big picture and, and getting a, a big overview of what we're talking about and then diving in from there. So uh, what is the elevator pitch, if you will, for Recool It? Yeah, Recool It uh, destroys refrigerant gases and sells high quality carbon credits. Those are both complicated world, so I'll break them down. Refrigerants are the most powerful greenhouse gases on the planet, contribute about 6% of global climate change, and they're in basically every refrigerator, every air conditioner on the planet. Uh, we keep them out of the atmosphere, we destroy them, and then we sell them to individuals or companies that want to support climate positive work, either to offset their own emissions and make a carbon neutral claim, or just as part of a broader sustainability strategy. Amazing. And okay. our credits are Oh, sorry. Yeah. Our credit, just one last piece is that our credits are high quality in the sense of provable, transparent, coming with a full digital audit trail and backed by third party verification. Great. Okay. So yeah, lots of stuff to go through one, one at a time there. So I appreciate you already defining refrigerants. So, but if we just take a, a slightly closer look um, at that, so refrigerants exist in any refrigerator or air conditioner. And I suppose based on the name, and how you described it, a refrigerant is some form of either gas or chemical or something that actually causes things to get cold. Is that right? Yeah. So without going too much into the details, some of which I don't understand on the technical <laughs> side, uh, almost all refrigerators and almost all cooling devices on the planet use what's called the vapor compression cycle. They take a substance, pump it around, alternately compress it and evaporate it to move heat from where you want to be cold to the rest of the world. Uh, so from the inside of your fridge to the outside of your apartment. Um, and the, the gases that are chosen to cycle around the system are called refrigerants. They've been chemically crafted basically to have particular properties. Um, there are other cooling technologies out there that don't use refrigerants or that use less harmful ones, but these are you know 90 to 99% of what's out there. Okay. And, and these refrigerants contribute to 6% of climate change. How, why? Oh, that's right. So when they're in operation within the system, it's all contained, it's all sealed, it's fine. What the problems happen when they escape the system, and that can be leaks during normal use, it can be intentional vape venting during a maintenance cycle, it could be a device being decommissioned at end of life. Um, and there are, you know, basically, those gases reach the atmosphere where they have warming potential thousands of times worse than carbon dioxide, just for chem because of their chemical properties. They just trap more heat. Um, there's a measure called GDP, G, sorry, GWP, which allows you to compare different gases on kind of the same scale. Um, and, you know, in some places, there's a one aspect we haven't, well, I'm sure we'll touch on a lot more is the geography. Uh, in some places like the US and Europe and Japan, there are more regulations around use of these gases, facing them out um, and better kind of commercial ecosystems to collect them uh, instead of letting them be vented. We operate in emerging markets, our first markets, Indonesia, where there's really nothing, nothing else kind of working on this problem. Gotcha. And okay, so, so you make sure that basically these refrigerants are not leaked or just kind of thrown away into a dumpster somewhere to to exist in, in the atmosphere and, and you destroy them. How, how do you make sure that they're actually destroyed and they don't accidentally, you know, they aren't leaked. Yeah. So we, uh, one kind of key realization for us was that most of these emissions are not just 
kind of leaks when no one is watching. Most of this is actually someone opening a valve and watching the gas hiss out. Oh, um, okay. It's during that maintenance cycle or during an end of life decommissioning. And so what we do is we just partner with the you know, servicers, the technicians, the in-house facilities management teams, in some cases for big installations uh, that are on the ground doing this. And, you know, they're not doing it because they're evil and they hate the environment, but it's inconvenient and expensive for them to do it in a better way. They don't have tools or training. So we work with them, we support them, we you know, onboard them as users to our software platform and to our kind of logistics network. Um, and it, when they're in those situations where the gas can't be reused, uh, and would otherwise be vented. They just collect it on our behalf. We pay them, we operate this network that kind of pulls it back into the center. Um, we track all that digitally, and then we destroy the gas. Or actually, a, another set of partners destroys the gas for us. Um, yeah, one of my questions was, what's in it for them to make sure that they actually deliver it to you rather than just watching? Because like you said, if it's inconvenient and it, and expensive you know for them to to get this gas and schlep it all the way over to you there has to be some incentive so you, so you pay them something that is makes it worth their while and then the destruction that's part, right so i mean you think about like the product that we create is a carbon credit and so everything on the production side or the supply side of that credit everything that goes into preventing that emission we're paying we're trying to make our partners lives as easy as possible um and you know all of that is kind of expenses for us Mm -hmm. makes sense that's your right that's right that's your product and that's where your cost is um that's right. and then the destruction element um I, i'm imagining that these it's it's gas so it's coming in like some sort of metal containers or something and something happens yeah, it, it, we, we transport it around in cylinders you can picture the propane tank under your barbecue right um same same kind of thing or tanks 10 or 100 times bigger than that um but yeah, you, you know, you move around you, and then you find an appropriate destruction technology. And there are a number of them that have been approved by this UN body that looks at this stuff, the Montreal Protocol TEAP. And you just pump the gas into essentially a place that's hot enough and will hold onto gas, the gas for long enough that the molecules break apart. These are pretty complicated molecules that don't spontaneously form in nature. So once you've cracked them, cracked them apart, they don't reform. You don't have to worry about like permanence the way you do with some other climate change, carbon dioxide stuff. Um, and the, the resulting emissions are basically negligible compared to the harm that the gas would have had if you had just lived it. And so, I mean, one, once you let those things go after it's been destructive, what are you actually letting go into the atmosphere? Is that stuff that you don't really need to worry about? Because it's like just what basic Yeah, so it, it depends on the particular destruction technology. Oh, okay. um, actually, the way that we're destroying right now is we're co-processing in a cement kiln, which means, you know, cement is made in these giant ovens, you know, essentially a big tube, 30 feet wide, hundreds of feet long, suspended 80 feet in the air, 2000 degrees Celsius. And so all the cement is kind of baking in there and we just pump the gas in at the same time. Um, and it's got this nice, you know, these, this nice chemical property that the byproducts of the refrigerant destruction are acidic, but cement is basic. So the refrigerant they breaks apart in the kill and then the byproducts neutralize with the cement. And because we're destroying much, you know, our refrigerant is a much smaller quantity compared to the hundreds of tons of cement that are in there at a given time. It just like there's really no, uh, no emissions to speak of from that. That's so cool. And what I love about that specific process is that you're not actually requiring any extra energy to be used in order to do it. It's not like you just have to set up a separate refrigerant destruction plant and then start, you know, pumping heat there. You're just like, oh, there's a cement factory. They have heat. Let's just pump it in there and call it a day. Exactly. exactly. Um, and like, I mean, to be fair, these gases are so powerful that whatever energy used to destroy them is just going to cancel out in the grand scheme of things. Um, you know, we're talking about like a 2000 X multiplier for these gases. So, you know, you're using less than half a percent probably in energy yeah. to destroy it, but still, yeah, I mean, it is, it is a nice process that we've, that we're using. I'm surprised about the refrigerant um, exponential, you know, compared to carbon dioxide from a greenhouse gas, um, or for, yeah, comparison to carbon dioxide, because um, it's always talked about that methane is the is the most intense, the worst, the most evil. You know that's why cows burping are the worst thing in the world. Um, I don't remember the exact number now. I don't know if you have it offhand in terms of what methane is, in terms of how much stronger it is as a greenhouse gas compared to carbon dioxide. Yeah, methane I think is twenty three or twenty five times worse than CO two. Okay. Um, and so, you know, we're another hundred times worse than that. Yeah. So it's, it's uh, substantially more. 
Yeah. Yeah. And and an interesting digression is that those multipliers, there's actually a, that's not a purely scientific question. There's a bit of judgment that goes into it because essentially carbon dioxide lasts a long time in the atmosphere and these other gases last for much shorter, under a hundred years usually. So you have to pick a time span on which you care about impact. And this gets into some interesting climate science questions like, mm. do we care about where the planet will be in 2100 or do we care about the peak temperature rise over the next 20 or 30 years? And so these multipliers that I'm giving you, 25 for methane, 2000 for the refrigerants, are based on a hundred year time frame. which in my opinion and some other people, although it's still a fringe opinion, this is way too long. And we should be much more concerned at the next about the next 20 or 30 years because you know if we hit certain peak temperatures, we unleash feedback loops to make it harder and harder to stem the damage eventually. Whereas, mm. you know, a hundred years versus 105 years from now, not that big of a deal. Like we'll either have solved it or we won't have. Um, and so when you look at that shorter time frame, these methane and refrigerants look actually much more, even worse. They look forward to, you know, some I think three to four X how bad they are on the hundred year time frame. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting perspective. And um it's yeah, these numbers end up being substantially more complicated once you really start digging into it. It's not like and this is I find myself saying this a lot when it comes to anything related to sustainability. It's always there's always a lot more to it than just you know, it, it's not quite as surface level as I think it frequently is presented. And um, yeah, there's a lot of caveats, a lot of fine print, along with many claims and with many, um, uh, many of the solutions that are presented. Um, out of curiosity, just going back to the cement manufacturing, because cement is actually another huge emitter of greenhouse gases. And it's... Uh, I, I think it's only now becoming mainstream. I, I know that Bill Gates talked about it quite a bit in his book. Um, but it does pumping the refrigerants in there do anything to mitigate the uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the cement manufacturing process? Unfortunately not. Okay. Um, that would have been such a great no, opportunity. <laughs> no, there's, I mean, yeah, cement, cement is really bad. And cement is interesting in that the emissions from cement are kind of, and I'm not an expert in this by any means, but my understanding is that emissions from cement come from two buckets, one which is energy use for cement manufacture, and the other which is just off-gassing of CO2 chemically from mm -hmm. the manufacturer of cement. And so in that way, it's actually a lot like air conditioning, because air conditioning use, most, most of the energy, most of the attention going to the climate impact of air conditioning actually focuses on the energy use of air conditioning, which is massive as well. But then there's also this direct emissions from refrigerants. And so it's it's kind of the same shape of the problem and there's some interesting um, similarity to how you would think about it. But no, in terms of the chemical process of what we're doing, it doesn't affect the cement emissions at all, unfortunately. Okay, yeah, well, one step at a time, I suppose. Um, but it's, yeah, it's it's yeah, great. If that... we can knock 6% off global emissions, maybe I'll think about cement next. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think 6% is a good, a really nice little chunk. So you mentioned that the all of this work that you're doing on this side, this is what, what you're calling the um, the supply side, meaning it's it's basically the product. Um, it's it's the work that you're doing and what you're actually selling and the way that Recool It makes its money is by uh, selling, and this is the, I suppose the demand side uh, is carbon credits. So carbon credits or carbon offsets have um, some, I'm not sure how everyone feels about carbon offsets. I've heard very uh, kind of pro and con camps uh, for it. I, I personally believe that carbon offsets are an important tool that we have in our tool belt. And and it's an important um, aspect of achieving our, our climate goals. And, and it carbon offsets fund a lot of fantastic work like what you're doing, um, as well as reforestation, ocean conservation, and so on. But I'm, I'm curious to know, if we first start just by talking about, um, you mentioned that you sell sell these credits to individuals and companies. Um, why are they buying your credits specifically? Yeah, uh, I got distracted by thinking about all of these other interesting questions that you sort of pointed at with carbon credits, which I would yeah. love to get into. And we can talk about that as well. <laughs> I'm just, I, I'd like, I want to just start sort of bigger picture and then dig a little deeper into that. Yeah. Yeah. So essentially there are a bunch of different things that you look for when you're buying carbon credits and these get wrapped up into, I would say what, well, you know, you can think of it sort of wrapping up into a single dimension of quality and in, in short, ours are very high quality. And that's why people would be, you know, people are trading off quality and price 
ours are at what I think is a particularly attractive point on that curve where we are cheaper. You know, it's, I remember reading like LeBron James is stronger than everyone who's faster than him and faster than everyone who's stronger than him. And that's a, a basketball reference that people aren't, <laughs> I think everyone knows who LeBron James is. Um, I feel like we're sort of like that with, with quality and price and credits. Like we're cheaper than anyone who's higher quality than us. And there actually aren't so many of those. And we are better quality than anyone who's cheaper than us. Um, and so when you think about quality, there are a few things that you look at. Probably the number one is what's called additionality. So it's just, if we didn't do the work we were doing, you didn't buy our credits, what would happen? And you could also think of this as the counterfactual. And it's super clear, right? The technicians are opening the valves. That's what they That's what they were doing before we got there. That's what they're doing when we don't show up. That's what they're doing in parts of Indonesia we haven't gotten to yet. And so, yeah, that gas gets released. Um, a second is permanence. So the work we do, does it delay these emissions or does it prevent them forever? And this tends to be an issue with offset types that rely on natural systems or storage of carbon, but we have this destruction process that is fully permanent. So stack up super well there. Um, there's some other, you know, uh, leakage is another one that people look at. It doesn't really apply to us. Uh, negativity, again, neg our negativity is super clear. One other thing people look at is co-benefits. So besides the sort of stated carbon quantity, like what else are you doing for the world? And so, you know, some, some offsets that rely on natural systems like forests or mangroves have biodiversity benefits or community empowerment benefits, uh, which are meaningful. And we, you know, don't, we're not at the top of the charts for those, certainly. Uh, but from a pure kind of like technical, how much carbon did you prevent? How easy is it to know? How permanent is it? What would have happened if you hadn't done the work? We are at the top of the charts. And yeah, I should say, in addition to the kind of core science of what we're doing, we also provide our buyers with a dashboard so they can view exactly the data that you know they purchase, not just a piece of our project, but gas from a particular air conditioner or covered by a particular technician. We show them all that evidence, which really no other carbon carbon credit seller does. Um, we've put a lot of work into that transparency. We've just started rolling out some exciting new features there. So um, I think those are kind of the two components the underlying project work and this transparency element. Gotcha. So I, I you know, from that point of view, I think it, it's, it makes sense um, with the quality and the prices you were talking about um, and the way that you're approaching it. It's um, makes sense why someone would want to purchase the credits. Going back to what we were, what I was pointing out earlier in terms of the pro and cons of, of offsetting or, or using carbon credits as a means to, um, you know, achieve climate action. What are your thoughts on that? Because I, I, like I said, I personally believe that it's an important tool. Um, carbon credits allow great work to be funded uh, in ways that perhaps you would have to rely on philanthropy, which can sometimes be extremely difficult to actually gather enough financing uh, to make a meaningful impact quickly. Um, but the, I suppose the counter argument to that is it allows certain corporations in particular to carry on doing what they're what they're doing now without any regard to actually making any changes because they just sort of get to use these get out of jail free cards that they buy and it just becomes a little tax that they pay rather than needing to make any changes um what are your thoughts on that as as someone who is you know creating the means for those companies to do it that way should you choose to look at it in that way yeah, well, I'll say, you know, if there are any oil companies that want to buy their way out of doing their own climate action by purchasing our credits, you can find my email address. Like, I would be happy happy to help you it's wriggle your way out of that one. Um, no, more, more seriously, um, I think carbon credits are a piece of the underlying action that we will need to take as a, you know, an economy, a civilization, a nation, a species, however you want to think about it, uh, to decarbonize and, and prevent or reverse global warming. Um, it's certainly not the only part of the solution and it's not if a hundred years from now people are still buying carbon credits the way that we are today i think probably something will have gone terribly terribly wrong um that will not that's not an optimistic future i think is it termination shock that has the like a sci-fi book that has the like bitcoin ba the blockchain based like carbon credits extending to the future anyway anyway um not not i'm not super optimistic about that um yeah, I mean, with carbon credits, it's important to recognize first that there are two types, right? There's compliance credits and voluntary credits. And so compliance credits, I think people have much less of an issue with where, uh, for example, under the California cap and trade system, big, indus big industrial corporations, big polluters uh, can only emit a certain amount and they can you know, buy like, I think 
by offsets corresponding to something like 12% of those emissions. Uh, they can't do 100%. And so I think that's a lot less objectionable. Um, for voluntary credits, it's really just what are you comparing it to, right? Like, again, what's the counterfactual? Is Shell going to stop making oil, you know? And like, if they were to do that, would somebody else buy up those oil fields? It was like, yes, of course they would. Um, and are we going to like boycott oil? Can we move to 100% EVs tomorrow? No, we can't, right? So this is, you know, I think it's better that dollars be going to these projects than they not be. It's good that there's some system for kind of standardizing the claims that companies can make and the impact of the different ways that places these dollars are going. Um, and carbon credits allow you to some extent at least to do that. And so I think it's, you know, it's maybe not a first best solution, it's the second best. Uh, and I think that there's obviously a lot of problems in the existing carbon credit market, which we can get into in great depth if we want. Uh, but yeah, the sort of like underlying idea that dollars should go towards carbon projects that can do planet positive things, measure that impact, and compete on how efficiently they can do it. You know, that using a market mechanism, that makes a ton of sense to me. And I think the, that this is a good thing to exist, at least over the next, I don't know, 10 to 20 years. Yeah, uh, and I agree with that. I think um, the, the, it's kind of a, a mixed bag in that it has to, the approach can't be done in a, in a vacuum. So if the carbon offsetting is the only thing that's being done by the corporation, then perhaps there is a real issue, but if it's done in concert, you know, simultaneously with other uh, meaningful actions, um, then, it, you know, it makes sense because like you said, it's just, it, from my point of view, it's just not feasible for us to shift all the way to 100% renewable energy tomorrow. And if a large oil and gas company just stops producing, then there are going to be a lot of negative repercussions to that, that I don't think anyone is willing to live with, you know, I mean, including hospitals not working, schools not working, your iPhone not working, you know, these are all disastrous things. Um, yeah. So, you know, we've- Yeah, come... I think we saw some of that, right, with the invasion of Ukraine and Europe's dependence on Russian fossil fuels. I mean, right. that became very clear, all this kind of really, these really scary scenarios are like, can people in Germany heat their homes over the winter? Right. Well, yeah, I mean, so like, we are not at a point where we can power that on renewables yet. Um, I think another, just another angle also is to think about you know, offsets as performing some piece, so providing like a price mechanism, performing some piece of company decarbonization, right? So going back to the cement companies that we were talking about, maybe they can power, maybe they can power the cement process through renewable energy, right? Through geothermal or something. And they don't, you know, they shouldn't be buying offsets for that. But if we can't find a non-emitting source of uh, like, you know, the direct emissions from cement, right? The just chemical process of it. So people talk about this as like hard to abate sectors. Uh, offsets have a place, maybe have a place for those last remaining hard to abate sectors, you know, aviation and jet fuel is another one people talk about, They're like, we just can't, maybe we just can't have an aviation industry without it having climate impact. And we will need to offset that in perpetuity. And that's okay. Whether that's what 5% of, you know, total, total today's emissions or 10% or 20%, I don't know. Uh, you know, I think that's an open scientific question, but yeah, maybe, maybe we think about it as like, Covering that last piece, not the full hundred percent of emissions today. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And um, yeah, I mean, having, I think it's it's uh, the focus is on removing what what you can start with the low hang, lowest hanging fruit. Um, just get that out of the way, and then just keep working through it. And as science progresses, and as we keep doing the research and finding ways to do it, we will slowly chip away at the harder and harder and harder to abate sectors. And that's where I think carbon credits, at, to your point, um, really have a role to play is start at the most difficult end and kind of meet, you know, hopefully not too close to the middle, but, you know, uh, mostly at the hard, hardest to abate areas. Yeah. And I think some of this is, is just language too. I mean, I think some people get upset when companies say that they're carbon neutral or net zero, and there's mm -hmm. some sort of like emotional or moral component. And there's a movement that, you know, I, I don't know if I agree with everything they say, but that basically says companies shouldn't do this. They should just donate X percent of their revenues or profits to climate projects. And we're, we're all happy with that. And we call it a day and nobody makes any claims about offsetting. Um, you know, that has the benefit of getting out of these moral questions and just focusing on what's your impact. But it has the, I would say the drawback of you're moving away from this standardized quantification and it, you know, people can 
it, it gets into some of the problems that have plagued the nonprofit world for a long time of like, how do you compare across different projects if you don't have that standard unit of quantification? Yeah, agreed. What was the moment you realized this was the work that you wanted to do? Uh, okay, uh, I, I I remember exact, exactly this moment, but it will take a bit of backstory. So um, my background is not originally in climate or refrigerants or any of this at all. I was working as a data scientist in San Francisco, thinking about climate sort of as a new opportunity to explore in 2019. Read a book called Project Drawdown, which listed different climate solutions in order of just how big they could be. And refrigerant management actually was number one on their list in the original book. And, you know, it's obviously 6%. It's not energy usage, but it's such a tightly scoped problem. And the whole thing is really the same, the same problem, that, that whole 6% that if you fix it, you can have a massive impact. And so I started reading about it, thinking about what I could do, like developing the idea that would later become Recool It. And I was talking to this mentor of mine in a coffee shop in downtown Berkeley. And he was like, Lewis, what's this, what's this crap you've been thinking about? Like, tell me all about it. <laughs> and and I sort of like laid it out and like ranted it in for an hour about refrigerants. I was like, well, I don't know, like, what should I do? And he he just like looked me in the eye. He's like, look, you know, you're young, you, you know, you don't have kids yet. Like, this is your moment. If like go do something crazy, go move to Southeast Asia, you know, go after it. Now, like I didn't quit my job the next day, but that sort of stuck in my head was like, yeah, okay. That's like you kind of kind of like push off the diving board in that moment. And uh that's what that's what like set me, set me irreversibly I would say on this path that I'm on it's amazing and then two years ago you moved to Jakarta that's right that's right so uh I actually originally went to Cambodia to do I identified Southeast Asia as kind of a hot spot for this moved to Cambodia without much planning or thinking uh did a bit of research very quickly realized that wasn't the right place uh and then picked Indonesia for a variety of good business reasons <laughs> uh such as market size and density and kind of level of economic development appropriate to what we were doing. Um, so yeah, I moved here two years ago, uh, so mid-2021, and have been here ever since. Amazing. Built the yeah. team here. Uh, yeah, started, got going. I, and I imagine that there is more work than you can probably know what to do with at this specific stage, uh, just because of how big of an issue this is, uh, which is both exciting and uh, and unfortunate, and that's always the, the challenge with the carbon market is when you have a big opportunity, it's exciting because you can fix it, but it just means that there's a big problem to, to solve. But what, what's next in terms of what you're focusing on right now? Where where do you see Recool It focusing on in the next you know year or two? Yeah, so I would say we're at a really interesting turning point, um, which is basically that we've We've made sense. I mean, I would say the demand side for the credits, you know, it's been pretty clear the whole time. Like we have to get a methodology and get verified and we're going to distribute our credits through some marketplaces. And we've been slowly onboarding with them and we're actually about to launch on our first third party marketplace Congratulations. Uh, next month. And that's to launch on Ren. It's our, our first third party marketplace. Um, yeah. But then on the supply side, I would say it's taken us a while to kind of make sense out of the, the confusion that we have found in the industry. I mean, understand the different channels we should be going after, how we pursue them, what we need in terms of our team and um, network and product to support that. And I think we've really narrowed that, you know, made sense of that into a couple of key supply channels for us. And now it's just a matter of pursuing them and trying to scale them as much as possible. Uh, and, you know, our credit sales mechanism is now developed enough that within a couple of months, we'll be able to sort of bottle like a funnel the credits we generate through and find find buyers for them. Um, so it's really, we just want to like hit the lever, hit the throttle, uh, basically raise some money so we can focus on growth over the next couple of years. Um, I would say the next kind of turning point for us will be when we start looking at our second country to expand internationally uh, beyond Indonesia. And if things go well, that could be in a year, maybe 18 months. Um, but that would be about kind of making sure that we have our our software product and our operations and our playbook kind of tight enough that we can go and in some way deploy it and inflate whether that's a you know partnering with existing entities or setting up shops somewhere else um yeah, yeah. Well, well that's super exciting i mean you have a sounds like it's very fast paced and and full on and yeah you've got big plans and uh a whole lot of a whole lot of work to do ahead of you but it's it's exciting to see how 
I, you know, you're taking this challenge head on and and really looking to make a big impact. So for anyone who's interested in learning more about Recool it or even buying uh, some, some of your credits once they're available, where's the best place to go and, and, you know, learn and, and buy and get involved? Yeah. Uh, so we have a website, um, recoolit.com. Check it out. It's, uh, we actually just re revised it. So it's hopefully a little bit easier to access and not just full of hundreds of words of text that I spat up on a page with no editor. Um, and now, now there's some pictures. Uh, I've been told that pictures are good to have on a website. Um, yeah. And so that explains in some level of detail what we're doing, um, why it's important and how you can help. The main way for, I would say, most people to help is by buying credits, um, one off or subscriptions. And you can do that directly on our website today. Um, and then, you know, you can start with a small purchase, look at kind of the evidence that's provided, see if you find it compelling and then subscribe if that's what you want. Um, yeah. And then we're always obviously just looking for connections to other companies thinking about the same issues, or if your company buys offsets or you'd like for your company to, to start buying offsets and to, you know, go carbon neutral with our help, we're happy to, happy to obviously have those conversations. Um, yeah, I would say that's that's the main one right now. We're also, as I mentioned, looking to fundraise within the next couple of months. So folks who invest in climate startups, Southeast Asia, understand the carbon market. It's always good to have those conversations. Uh, would love any introductions that come out of us. Amazing. Well, Lewis, thank you very much for your and, time. Oh, I should just I should just add, sorry, yeah. like you can email me directly. You don't need to fill out the contact form on the website. I'm Lewis at Regalwith.com. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter as well. Uh, I love getting emails from strangers. Um, keep hopefully not like long rants, although those are sometimes fun too. I've gotten a few of those. <laughs> well, yeah, Lewis, thanks very much for, for sharing all that. And for anyone who's interested in, in reaching out to Lewis and, and talking to him directly, please do. Uh, he wants to hear from you, um, as he, as he just said. So, um, but yeah, Lewis, thanks very much for your time for going through this. I, I love your passion and enthusiasm for a, a problem that clearly has, um, it, it, the good news is it has a clear solution. It just needs to be done. And, uh, you know, it's great to see that you're actually doing the work and, and taking those steps and the necessary action to mitigate 6% of global greenhouse gases that are contributing to climate change. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to, to watch you grow over the next, uh, you know, two, three years. Um, I think the plans you've outlined are, are really exciting. So best of luck moving forward. And uh, I'd love to stay in touch. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for giving us the opportunity to share what we're doing, uh, get it in front of a bigger audience and for your keen questions. Although you we left a lot of things undiscussed. Uh, it's a that huge we could have topic. Gone way deeper into. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh if we we're going to record a six hour director's cut of this <laughs> later, right? And you'll make that available through the same channels. Exactly. <laughs> Just yeah. tank all your podcast metrics. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, watch out for that. <laughs> thanks so much, Lewis. Appreciate well, thanks, it. Daniel. Yeah. Take care.